in the following couple of videos, we will cover a family of Gaussian filters called sigma point filters that are based on the moment matching principle. Now, there are quite a few filters that are based on this idea. In principle, the only difference between them is the method that they use to compute the involved expectation integrals. The specific variants that we will cover in this course are the uncentered comma filter and the cubital comma filter. Now, in this video, we'll look at how we can explain this family of filters using the moment matching principle. Now, in this course, we mainly consider models of the following type. That is, both the motion model function and the measurement model function are possibly nonlinear functions, but the noise components are additive and Gaussian. Now, it's straightforward to generalize these methods that we are about to study to non-additive Gaussian noise, but we'll not cover that here. In many cases, we will also drop the time indices of f and h, but that's just for notational convenience. As mentioned in the previous video, the idea in Gaussian filtering is to perform filtering using the conventional prediction and update step, but where we approximate the predicted and updated density as Gaussian densities, like this. This means that filtering boils down to finding these four moments. So we need to find the mean and covariance of the predicted density and the mean and covariance of the updated density. So the problem that we are facing is how can we choose these moments such that our Gaussian density approximates these non-Gaussian densities as good as possible? So let us consider how one can do that. Suppose, for instance, that we are given a non-Gaussian density, P of x, now, P of x could, for instance, look something like this, if x is scalar. Our task is to find x hat and p such that P of x is approximately Gaussian with mean x hat and covariance p. One strategy is to select x hat and p to match the moments of P of x. We call this strategy the moment matching principle. So we ensure that x hat is the mean of P of x, and that capital P is the covariance of P of x, which can be expressed like this. So x hat is this integral here, so an integral of x times P of x dx, and capital P is this integral here, where we have x minus x hat times x minus x hat transpose times P of x dx. Now, note that we can view this covariance here as an expected value, where we take the expected value of this function here. So in order to do moment matching, we basically need to calculate these two expected values, which are expressed by these two integrals here. For the example that we looked at up here, the mean of the Gaussian would be in the middle here. So the bell-shaped Gaussian approximation would look roughly something like this. So this would be our Gaussian approximation of P of x. Now, if you think that the moment matching principle seems a bit arbitrary, there is a theoretical argument in favor of the principle. Namely, one can show that moment matching minimizes the kullback leibler divergence. Now, if you're not familiar with the kullback leibler divergence, you don't need to learn it for this course. In this case, it's something that tells us how similar P of x is to our Gaussian approximation. So, a small kullback leibler divergence means that the approximation is good and a large kullback leibler divergence means that this is not such a good approximation. Now, among all the moments x hat and p, these are the choices that gives the smallest kullback leibler divergence. Let us see how we can make use of the moment matching principle to perform the prediction in the prediction step. We assume that we are given the updated posterior distribution at time k minus 1, and in the Gaussian filtering case, we assume that this is a Gaussian. Further, as we pointed out before, we assume that the motion model is a nonlinear function of the state plus some Gaussian noise. To compute the Gaussian approximation to the predicted density, we simply compute the first two moments of the random variable xk given y1 to k minus 1. So these are the mean x hat k given k minus 1, which is the expected value of this. To calculate this expected value, we need to solve the integral of f xk minus 1 times our Gaussian prior, the xk minus 1. And that is because qk minus 1 is zero mean. So it does not contribute to this expected value here. Similarly, to compute the covariance of the predicted distribution, we take the covariance of xk given y1 to k minus 1. Now we can separate this into the covariance of qk minus 1 plus the covariance of f of xk minus 1. So the covariance of qk minus 1 is just capital qk minus 1. And the covariance of f of xk minus 1 
is this integral here, where we take the integral of f of xk minus 1 minus the predicted mean times the same thing again, transposed, times this Gaussian density again. And we integrate over xk minus 1. So by doing this, we can perform the prediction step. The connection to the moment matching principle is that we have a density p of xk given y1 to k minus 1, which we approximate as a Gaussian distribution with the same mean and the same covariance as our possibly non-Gaussian predicted density. So this is approximately Gaussian with mean x hat k given k minus 1 and covariance p k given k minus 1 where these moments are selected such that they match the mean and the covariance of the possibly non-Gaussian predicted density, which we obtain using these equations here. Another thing that I would like you to notice is that both these integrals have a similar form, and that is that we have a function times a Gaussian that we take the integral of, and here we have a function times a Gaussian that we take the integral of. As we will see later, all the integrals we need to solve can be written on this form. Now this will come in handy when we want to find good approximations of these integrals. To perform the update step using moment matching, it's just a bit more complicated. We are now given a Gaussian approximation to the predicted density, and we have a measurement model with a nonlinear function of our state plus some additive Gaussian noise. The ideal solution, according to the moment matching principle, is to set x hat k given k and pk given k to the first two moments of the posterior density, so density of xk given measurements up to time k. Unfortunately, it turns out that it's difficult to compute the first two moments of this distribution in an efficient manner. Now, that doesn't mean that there are no methods that do that, but it's just that they are less efficient. An alternative strategy is to perform moment matching on the joint distribution of xk and yk. Now, it turns out that this is much easier, so we approximate xk and yk, given all the previous measurements, as a Gaussian using moment matching. Once we obtain a Gaussian approximation of this, we can find the desired density analytically and nicely using the lemma on conditional Gaussian distributions that we have looked at previously in this course. So the idea is to approximate the joint distribution of xk and yk as Gaussian. Now the difficult part is to find the mean and the covariances here, Fortunately, we already know the expected value of xk given y1 to k minus 1, and that is x hat k given k minus 1, and its covariance is pk k minus 1, since these are given by the prediction step. So at least we know these two components here. Now, to find the mean and covariance of yk given y1 to k minus 1, we make use of the measurement models that tells us that yk is equal to h of xk plus rk. This means that the expected value of yk given y1 to k minus 1 is the expected value of rk plus the expected value of h of xk. But since rk is zero mean, the expected value is simply the expected value of h of xk, which is given by this integral here. So we take the integral of h of xk times this Gaussian predicted density here, and then we integrate over xk. To compute the covariance of yk, which is the covariance of these two terms, we can use that these two are independent. This means that this covariance here will decompose into two terms. First, the covariance of RK, which is capital RK, and then the covariance of H of XK, which is this covariance here. So the covariance of YK given Y1 to K minus one decomposes into one component corresponding to the measurement noise, so RK, and one component corresponding to the uncertainty in xk, which is given by this integral here. So we now know the mean of y and the covariance of y. So the only thing that remains is to compute the cross covariances here. Before we do that, we should note that p of yx is just p of xy transpose. So it's enough that we compute one of them and then we're done. By definition, the cross covariance p x y is the expected value of xk minus the predicted mean times yk minus the predicted measurement transpose. From the measurement model, we can see that yk is h of xk plus rk, where rk is zero mean and independent of xk. This means that the term rk will not contribute to the covariance, so we can simply replace yk with h of xk. By doing so, the expected value can be expressed like this integral here we will take the integral over this product where we have replaced yk with h of 
xk times the predicted density of xk, and then we integrate over xk. Finally, I would like you to note again that all the integrals that we need to solve here have the same form as the previous integrals. Namely, it's a nonlinear function times a Gaussian, and it's a nonlinear function times a Gaussian, and a nonlinear function times a Gaussian. So that's the only type of integral that we need to learn how to solve. Once we manage to do that, we can compute all the moments here, and then we're almost done. The only thing left is how to put it all together to express the updated density. Suppose that we have managed to compute the first two moments of the joint distribution of xk and yk. In that case, we know from the lemma on conditional Gaussian densities that the conditional density, p of xk given yk and y12k one k minus 1, now this here is just y12k, one k, right, has the expected value x hat k given k minus 1, which is equal to the predicted mean plus the cross covariance between x and y times the covariance of y inverse times yk minus the predicted measurement. Expressed in the terms of the conventional Kalman filter equations, we can note that this part here is the same as the Kalman gain. And this part here is just innovation. So this is just the standard form of the Kalman filter update equation for the estimate. We also know from the same lemma that the posterior covariance pk given k is equal to the predicted covariance minus the cross covariance times sk inverse times the cross covariance transpose. Now, if we make use of this relation again, we can also write the whole thing here as common gain times sk times the common gain transpose, which might be a form that you recognize a bit better. As we can see here, the update equations look pretty much like the update equations in a conventional comma filter. However, there is an important difference, and that is that all the components here, so y hat k given k minus 1, sk, and pxy, all need to be approximated. In order to find these components, we need to solve integrals on the following form. So the integral of some nonlinear function of x times the Gaussian density of x, dx. And we will therefore dedicate the next video on techniques of how to solve these integrals.